In business today, three things to know. First, uh-oh, Apple, the world's largest tech company, reports earnings news, and it is a miss for iPhone sales. Then, is it over the cliff for emerging markets? Like lemons, investors follow each other and bail out as currency and equity markets in Brazil, Argentina, and Turkey get slammed. And deadlocked in South Africa, a strike against the world's top platinum producers may put the South African economy in a deeper hole. A rise exchange starts now. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Schmertz. The earnings news for Apple is out. Apple beat earnings expectations but missed on iPhone sales. Here are the rundown of the numbers. Earnings coming in at $57.59 billion or $14.50 a share. That is slightly better than estimates. But it is the one thing that most people probably care most about if you're an investor, which is iPhone sales. Apple sold 51 million iPhones. That is way below expectations of 54 to 57 million. They sold 6 million iPads. That is also below estimates. Apple lowering guidance on sales for this quarter as well. Apple closing up today to $550.53 a share, but those shares are sliding in the aftermarkets. Taking a look at the rest of the markets, the Dow closing at 15,838, down 4084. The S&P 500 to 1781, and the Nasdaq down to 4083. We'll see what the Nasdaq does tomorrow because of the sell-off in Apple. Google has agreed to acquire artificial intelligence company DeepMind. The deal is reportedly valued at about $400 million. Google closing at $1,101. Heavy equipment maker Caterpillar fourth quarter earnings rose 44% as the company cut costs to help offset a continuing decline in mining machinery revenue. Caterpillar reported a profit of a billion dollars a share or $1.54 a share up from $697 million a year earlier. Caterpillar closing at $91.24. And Southwest Airlines saying today it will start flying internationally. Flights to Aruba, the Bahamas, and Jamaica will begin in July. Southwest closing at 2060. Taking a look at commodities. Gold closing at $12.55 an ounce. Oil down to $95.79. The emerging markets are burning down. This week began with the same anxiety that dominated last. Currency markets continue to be crushed, and equities are following. India fell 1.3%. Thailand dropped 2.6%. This follows currency slides in Brazil, Argentina, and Turkey. Fact is, investors have been heading for the exits since mid-2013, but it now appears to be accelerating. Are there any fundamentals that will turn it around? Andrew Schiff from Euro Pacific Capital is back on a rise exchange to talk about the emerging markets, and we'll talk a little bit about the World Economic Forum in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to Exchange. So what is going on with the emerging markets? We have been hearing for some time now that there is weakness. It was driven, though, they believe, by the Fed policy. Mm -hmm. But now maybe something more is going well, on. Well, 2013 was not a great year for emerging markets. And generally speaking, they were flat while the, the Dow was up 30%. And the, the, the idea for that was that um, money was being sucked out of the emerging markets because most in, investors believed, and really the rat was in the fourth quarter more than anything else, but investors believed that QE was going to come to an end. So that meant that the dollar would strengthen and that, and that interest rates in the United States would rise. So the hot money, which had been parked overseas to get some type of yield, was going to come back to the States. That was the dominant idea. Um, and we, we believe that that's misguided because we don't think the Fed's going to end its QE in, in 20, right. 2014. Been, so you've been saying for a while right. that this, this tapering is temporary. Right. But when you come to the emerging markets, you, gotta, you can't pay them all at the same brush. You mentioned at the top of the show Argentina and Brazil. Now, Argentina and Brazil, well, Argentina has devalued its currency by deliberate internal policy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Brazil has been spending itself into a hole by, through the, for the Olympics and the World Cup. So they've been getting into their own kind of self-made problems. Other countries like Indonesia and, and, and Thailand, they're suffering from this kind of hot money withdrawals back into the United States, which I think is, it makes, makes those, those, those markets very, um, I think, attractive because they're, they're, their fundamentals are still pretty strong. I was going to ask you about the fundamentals because over the summer there was a rise in long-term interest rates in the U.S., and that was blamed for some of the sell-off in the emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And now, though, those rising interest rates have kind of come down mm -hmm. a little bit, right. and there's still a sell-off. Right. Uh, so what are the fundamentals that you like? I mean, it, China is obviously a problem for these countries well, China, as well. Well, China is, you, know, you can call that a problem. It, you know, it, it, it might be cooling down, but China China is still a growth story. I mean, mm -hmm. they're still putting up six or seven percent growth. 
um, and it's still clearly growing faster than the developed world, and they're, they're going to continue to suck in resources. But other co economies in, China, in the Far East are, are, don't have the kind of severe political problems and environmental problems that China has. I mean, things like Indonesia. Indonesia's a strong story. So, so is Thailand. I mean, yeah, there's some hot money flows. People think that they're going to spend themselves silly trying to maintain currency valuations uh, <clears throat> with respect to the dollar. We think that eventually they'll abandon that policy once the QE, uh, the fact that QE is not coming to an end is out of the bag and the Fed starts cranking up the presses again. So when you look at the uh, at the BRICS countries out there, you, should you be avoiding the BRICS and focusing on yeah, other I mean, emerging one markets, of the which is what you're saying? One of the countries we like is Mexico. I mean, that Mexico is a Part of the new MINT acronym, I should say. Well, it's Mex I'm, not sure, I'm not up on that, that, that acronym, but um, Mexico is a big uh, uh, play in our, in our South American fund. And if you look at um, if you look at some of the political and structural changes that mm -hmm. Mexico has done, they had a huge um, uh, political, uh, basically, revolution this year where, right. they, where they liberalized their energy sector, which is going to be a big, a, a big area of opportunity. They liberalized their telecom. They're doing a lot of difficult reforms, and that's happening in other places as well. The bad apples, the Argentinas in the world, tend to right. get more... Uh, more headlines. Are you um, are you looking at countries that are not devaluing their currency? Is that a good place? Yeah, to go? I mean, we try to stick with the fundamentals. I mean, we think uh, you know, being rich is better than being poor. Uh, <laughs> I don't know; it's a crazy idea. But a country, a, a strong currency is is the is a is a is the result of a strong economy. A strong currency gives your citizens more purchasing, purchasing power and makes your economy stronger. So we think that's a good place to invest. That makes your investments gain over time. So you like Mexico, other emerging markets that you think are going to weather this pretty well? Yeah, again, we, 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 we think that, first of all, Australia, which is not really an emerging market, but their currency has been hammered right. uh, in the last uh, three or four months. That's a good place. But we certainly like Thailand. We like uh, Indonesia. We like Singapore. We like South Korea. Not really a developed uh, uh, emerging market, but certainly a, a an Developing country, yes. Yeah. So those kind of, and of course, we also so like in Europe, we're investing. It's not not emerging, but nor, in nor Norway, Sweden, very strong uh, fundamentals in those countries. And uh, we just think that you know what's going to happen is, you know, we haven't had very much pain in this country. We've had we've had a two and a half percent drop in the in the Dow. People are getting are, are freaking out. You know, and, and it's nothing to freak out about. The nothing to freak out about it. But if we had some real pain, if we yes. saw housing prices kind of start turning over, we saw and we the stock prices some coming, there. That's coming right. down or interest rates really spiking up, the Fed's going to have to come right back you, in. And you think that's going to happen? I, I think so, because we can't really, we don't have an economy that can survive rates past 3%. And if, if rates, the only way the Fed can keep those below is if they go, if they go out and buy uh, bonds, because who else is going to buy them if they're not buying them? So when that happens, the Fed's going to come back in with QE, and then everyone's going to see that, that that trade that's driving money out of emerging markets was actually a mistake. Let me ask you about the great ski house party in Davos, mm -hmm. Switzerland, known as the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. I just came back from there, and I just like to say I just came back from the okay. World Economic Forum. I did not come back from Davos. Which is, which is I think, mm -hmm. why people go, by the way, yeah. to, because they to talk about it. Is this just a bunch of self-important people trying to talk with important people? Because they're talking a lot about emerging markets there. Um, is there going to be actual Well, action? I think the last important thing that came out of Davos was a new way to, to uh, display shrimp cocktail, and that was a couple years ago. <laughs> Big movement I missed, in shrimp I missed cocktail. that this yeah. year, really. Um, I, I think it's a way for, for wealthy people to talk to other wealthy, wealthy people. Um, you have a lot of top-down uh, thinkers that come down there and, and make these big pronouncements about how to make uh, the world grow, where I think the best way to, uh, to make the world grow is get all these big thinkers out of the way so that the markets can really do their, do their magic. And, and entrepreneurs running it, companies I can I wonder make whether decisions. the top of the echelon can really address equality at all. On this. Uh, you know, it's tough. You know, now Obama tomorrow is going to talk about equality. Um, you know, equality is something that can't be engineered. Equality, I believe, comes from a vibrant economy. Once barriers to entry are taken away, when the free markets are allowed to function, you, you get entrepreneurialism, you get, you get a growing uh, economic uh, a pie, and, and all boats are, are, are lifted. That's my belief. And that's been borne out over time. I mean, places like the United States and China that have used uh, Experience with, mm -hmm. with capitalism over the over over the past have have seen rising middle classes. Okay. Andrew Schiff, thank you so much. You're welcome. Appreciate the time. Coming up, we'll talk more about the miners' strike in South Africa. You're watching Arise Exchange. Because we live in a global, interconnected world, business news no longer stops when the markets close on Wall Street. And what we've discovered over the past few years in the financial crisis is that events and news that happen even in the smallest countries impact the United States and the world at large. As we bring together experts and analysts and thought leaders and CEOs and companies across many industries to not only provide the macroeconomic view, but news everyday people can use. 
Arise News is a different kind of network. We are able to tell our own stories, and we're able to cover stories in a way that other media outlets don't do. We've got world-class journalists, veteran journalists who have been in this industry for decades, not just in front of the camera, but behind the scenes as well. Arise News is a place where we can tell stories in an interesting, factual, inclusive way like no one else in the business can. Welcome back to Arise Exchange. The platinum strikes in South Africa continue where work at the world's three largest producers of the precious metal has come to a halt. Thousands of workers are demanding an increase in pay to $1,127 a month. This is almost double the current entry level pay. Officials say the negotiations have continued between the two sides, but no deal has been reached. South Africa has the largest reserves of platinum and relies heavily on metal exports for more than half of its foreign exchange earnings. The country's currency, the RAND, has slumped to its weakest level against the dollar since October 2008. Ivan Eland, senior fellow at the Independent Institute, joins us now with more. Ivan, thank you for coming to Arise Exchange. Let me ask you, what is the latest on where we stand with negotiations? Well, I think they they're, they haven't gone anywhere, and mm -hmm. uh, I think the government is definitely pressuring uh, because it wants to it it sees that the rand has declined and uh, wants action uh, to solve this crisis. As you mentioned, uh, platinum is very important for South Africa's foreign exchange earnings, and uh, so this is a very visible industry in South Africa and all, all over the world. And uh, of course, uh, that brings a lot of um, uh, pressure to settle the strike. And um, as our previous guest mentioned, when currency drops in poor countries, it becomes a significant economic burden on people, especially those on the lower side of the classes. Let me ask you this. The government of South Africa, of course, came out of the labor union. So, and I was speaking to the trade minister this past week, Rob Davies, and I asked him about this. How difficult is it for the government to get involved and not take the union side? Ivan? Uh, yes, well, I think, I think the unions, certainly the, the government is more sympathetic with the unions. I think in any time a government gets between labor and business, no matter what country it's in, it, there, there's, there's long-term consequences. In, in the eight, late 1800s in the United States, it was the opposite. Uh, the, the government sided with businesses up until uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, took the side of uh, miners in the coal strike. So I think... Uh, but but when you have government in the middle, it's it's very difficult to tell whether you're getting a fair settlement or not, or if it's just pressure, and whether that will be a long-term last, a long-lasting settlement, or whether it's just pressure to solve the problem so that the currency can go back up. Let me ask you something. South Africa has been having um, trouble with its economy for some time because it is a commodity-based economy. Uh, how much longer can this strike go on before South Africans really feel the impact? Well, I think, uh, you know, that's why the pressure is there to solve it. I think it probably will be solved fairly quickly because of the, the, high, the high profile that platinum has on the world markets and also uh, within the South African economy. So, you know, it's hard to say exactly how long it'll last, but I think the pressure is there to solve it. And can you run down for us some of the main issues here? Well, it's, as you were saying, you know, it's, it's wages really is the major one. The, the, the miners uh, are certainly not paid by, very much by Western standards, but they want to increase their salary more than double their wages, that is. And so uh, that's the major sticking point of, the, of, the, of the, the strike. And the position of the companies right now, uh, do you see any movement on their part? Are they going to come up with wages or are they sticking to their current position of, of where the wages are? Well, the companies claim that they're put in a bad position because of all the wildcat strikes right. in the last couple of years because there's two big uh, unions that are vying for for uh, uh, dominance in uh, South African labor, and they're fighting with each other. And uh, they, they had these wild, wildcat strikes, which affected the mines. So the, the mine owners, the mine companies, they, they think that they're in no uh, position after these previous strikes to uh, give up that much of a wage increase to the miners. 
Well, you know, in most neighbor negotiations, when they conclude in the United States, they ban those so-called wildcat strikes. Uh, do you know if that was the case here, or would, do you think the companies may move if they put those bans in place? And then will the government, of course, uh, enforce wildcat strikes the, against wildcat strikes? Well, of course, that's the, that is the major question, uh, given, as you said, the South African government is uh, probably partial to the labor unions in this particular case. So the question is, even if you get an agreement, will the South African government honor that agreement? So, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to say, I suppose, how, how things are enforced. But uh, certainly there, there's a big, that's a big issue in the, in the negotiations. And what do you think they're talking about right now at the higher echelons of the government about how this looks to the rest of the world because this is such an important, crucial part of the economy for South Africa. Uh, at one point, because you say they are pro-union, at what point do they start to worry here and maybe start trying to push the union for concessions? Well, I think they probably will uh, reluctantly, but, uh, you know, the, the financial markets do matter, and uh, certainly the currency uh, uh, markets matter, and I think that's going to be on the other side. That the, the government is pro probably pro very much pro labor, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, the world economy is pressuring on the other side to solve the crisis and for the government to ask the miners for for to not uh, you know to to make some concessions and uh, solve the strike. So Ivan, basically, you think that there's going to be a resolution relatively quickly? Any sort of timeline? And I know it's just a guess. Well, it is a guess, and I, but I'm just saying, I'm just thinking that the high-profile nature of this, uh, this commodity, uh, but there has been a lot of violence uh, in these wildcat strikes, and so if we have that, uh, mm -hmm. again, because they can't solve it, of course, uh, the thing could go on for a long time, and I, so I think that's also, uh, the potential for violence is also pressuring uh, the government to, to find a resolution in addition to the economic issues, so I think uh, that's why I think it may be solved uh, sooner rather than later. Okay, Ivan Elin, thank you for your opinion today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Time now for our business ticker. A major player in the Bitcom world has been arrested in New York. The U.S. government nabbed Charlie Schrem, the CEO of Bitcoin exchange BitInstant at JFK International Airport. He is being charged with laundering money for customers of the black market site called Silk Road. Schrem's BitInstant exchange lets people buy the digital currency Bitcoin at more than 700,000 locations in the United States, as well as Brazil, Russia, and elsewhere. It received a million and a half dollar investment last year from the Winklevoss twins of Facebook fame. Also arrested as co-conspirators is a Florida man who allegedly runs an underground Bitcoin exchange using the alias BTC King. One of Boeing's most popular commercial jets is facing more safety checks. The Federal Aviation Administration has called for inspections of more than 400 of Boeing's 767 planes, citing problems with rivets, which could cause failures or jams that affect the plane's ability to climb or descend. The wide-body jet has already been subject to earlier inspections for the same safety issues dating back to 2000. The craft store chain Michaels may be the latest victim of a cyber attack. Over the weekend, the store, with 1,200 locations across the U.S., warned customers that it may have experienced a data security breach. If a breach occurred, that would make Michaels the third major chain in a rash of assaults on U.S. retailers. Consumer electronics giant Samsung has struck two important licensing deals. One is a multi-year agreement with the Swedish telecom equipment maker Ericsson, and the other involves the cross-licensing of patents with Google. Both deals are meant to avoid costly patent-related litigation in the future. Samsung is also embroiled in legal fights with Apple. The CEOs of both companies are scheduled to meet in February to discuss an out-of-court settlement. Sam's Club is laying off 2,300 workers. The cutbacks at the warehouse chain, which is under the Walmart umbrella, affects about 2% of its workforce and will be across the board from hourly workers to middle managers. And despite the layoff, Sam's Club will open 15 new clubs this year. And for those who decide not to shave in November, you are ruining the economy. The trend for growing facial hair is cutting into Procter & Gamble's bottom line. The consumer products giant and owner of the razor company Gillette is blaming the increased popularity of beards, mustaches, and the scruffy look for a decline in their razor sales. Even so, the company has managed to find a silver lining. While faces are getting hairier, men have begun to shave their bodies elsewhere. Ouch. So now Procter & Gamble is promoting the trend of manscaping. And last year filed the trademark Gillette body, or call that for charity. Many men are not shaving mustaches during what they call Movember or November. Ahead, 
equating taxing the rich with the Nazis? Not such a good idea. Our favorite person of the day is next. You're watching Arise Exchange. Well, Arise is the only network that really covers uh, comprehensively the African diaspora. It gives people in other parts of the world of color a chance to know about people here in the United States, us to know about them, and the world to know about us. So it's kind of an educational experience for everybody involved. Getting to know people through stories, through personal stories, they really get a chance to know what people are actually all about, what communities are about. How are we different? But more importantly, what commonalities we all share. The great thing about Arise Entertainment 360 is that we cover the 360 of entertainment, food, fashion, lifestyle, culture. We're able to cover it all. And the thing I love most about the show is we're able to do a stunning combination of high and low. So we can talk about Rihanna on the red carpet, but we can also speak about high art with people like Sanford Biggers and Hank Willis. We actually spend quality time with our guests and we really get to know them. It's really intriguing because we get a 360 look at our guests. A follow-up to our earlier favorite person of the day, Trey Riddell, the Republican congressman from Florida who once supported drug testing for food stamp recipients, has resigned from Congress after pleading guilty to cocaine possession. Riddell pleaded guilty in November in Washington, D.C. and received a year of supervised probation. He then checked into a rehab center. There had been mounting pressure on him to quit, and so he did. Time now for our favorite person today when we pick one person who grabbed our attention and not for the right reasons. Today, that person is venture capitalist and billionaire Thomas Perkins. When will people learn that you shouldn't compare things to the Nazis unless it's a really legitimate pogrom where people are rounded up and killed in masses? Because that's not the story here. This weekend, Perkins complained in the Wall Street Journal that the campaign to tax the wealthy was akin to the assault of the Jews in Nazi Germany, going so far to say that progressive radicalism may become progressive Kristallnacht, which was the night when Nazi brown shirts broke the windows of Jewish-owned shops in the 1930s. Perkins ends his letter by asking, Kristallnacht was unthinkable in the 1930s. Is it a descendant progressive radicalism unthinkable now? The reaction to Perkins' letter was swift. His own firm, Kleiner Perkins, tweeted, quote, that Thomas Perkins has not been involved in the firm for years. We are shocked by his views. It's Thomas Perkins. And today, Perkins basically doubled down, saying poor people are also basically Nazis. And he can't understand why the media doesn't see that. So for comparing the night of the broken glass, one of the darkest days in history, to raising taxes on the wealthy, which is not the darkest day in history, Thomas Perkins is our favorite person of the day. Next, remember the phrase, let your fingers do the walking? How about let your thumb do the buying? The future of making purchases with your smartphone. You're watching Arise Exchange. Arise serves underserved communities by bringing them news, information, sports, and entertainment from places that are becoming part of the world economy, that are becoming a part of the world voice, and decisions that are affecting things in the world that people care about. They care about the economy. They care about safety and security. And if you come to Arise and you watch our broadcast, these are the things we're going to bring to you every day, 24 hours a day. One of the great things about Arise Entertainment 360 is we have this Arise to Your Health segment, which really focuses on the holistic approach of being healthy. So we do everything from working out to juicing to getting in shape by doing fun exercises like bouncing on a trampoline or wearing these bouncy boots on our feet when we're jumping all over the set. We've done karate. We've danced the weight off. We've done just about everything. And of course, I love when we eat on set, but we do it in a very healthy and clean way. Recapping our top story, shares of Apple and After Hours trading off by 6% right now after the tech giant reported iPhone sales missing expectations. More than 55% of all traffic to business websites are done using a smartphone. And analysts say the smartphone's popularity isn't going away anytime soon, and businesses are finally taking notice. Our next guest has helped more than 350 businesses boost their mobile visibility and advertising to accommodate smartphone 
and their users, generating big profits for his clients. Andrew Katz is the founder and CEO of Thumb Friendly, based in Atlanta. He joins us now from Atlanta to tell us all about it. Andrew, welcome to Arise Exchange. Pleasure to be here, Andrew. So, Love your show. Thank you. So um, I, we like to hear that. <laughs> so w if you're a retailer, uh, you've got to be kind of both terrified and also see an opportunity here. You're terrified because you're saying, you know, I have to keep redesigning my website, and now i got to take on a new technology because a retailer's website does not translate into mobile platforms. Correct. In most cases, there's a new technology called adapted design where a retailer build one website and it can work on all three screens, desktop, tablet, and mobile. So technology is improving to make it a little easier for retailers. And have you found But in most cases, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, and are retailers generally a little bit slow to react, just like the storefront retailers were slow to react to the web, are traditional web retailers, and it's hard to believe we're calling them traditional, um, but are they being slow to right. react? Uh, the last couple quarters, adoption seems to be a little better. Uh, they understand, even though Apple had really bad numbers today, mm -hmm. uh, I believe iPhone sales still outpace bursts. So they understand they have to go mobile to survive in the mobile economy. Okay, but so they're starting to come around a little more. Okay, so talk to me a little bit about how, you know, this past holiday season really in some ways was a game changer because we're starting to see uh, almost a majority of people who are making purchases do so through their mobile devices who did not go into stores. Absolutely. Great point, Andrew. So I think it was like 37% of all online sales for the two big days this year came from mobile devices, not even tablet devices, but mobile devices. People can easily order now from the comfort of their couch. And advertisers as well need to be able to reach these people. And I understand that's a little bit about what Thumb Friendly does. Talk to me a little bit about how your company integrates this. Correct. So Thumb Friendly, we do two things. We help advertisers with their mobile presence and to attract new clients through advertising. So Google, everybody knows how Google works. Um, you can advertise a 10 mile radius. So if you're an uh, ice cream shop in Belmar, New Jersey, for example, you can advertise on Google, but it doesn't really make that much sense for your business because your business is so local within a couple of blocks from the restaurant, from the ice cream shop. So t in today's world, there's technology out there that we utilize, they can actually advertise. It can be triggered by weather. So if it's gonna be 60 degrees tomorrow on Wednesday, or t tomorrow, Tuesday, mm -hmm. they can actually have an ad that comes up within a two to three block radius of their business only when it's going to hit 60 degrees. The ads will appear on major apps, uh, Weather Channel, uh, Words with Friends, and it's, it's, it's so close and the, the ad can say, hey, you want some ice cream? Hot day. You're only 400 steps away from the ice cream shop. So it's taken that. <laughs> and so that, it, it could do that without, so it, could, it could do that without you even asking if there's an ice cream shop around? Absolutely correct. It's a little uh, frightening because the odds are you're going to think, scary. hey, I kind of want ice cream, and then it's going to come up. Let me, and we're, we just saw some of your uh, good video just before. Let me ask you something, though. Uh, is there a danger here, though, that this could sort of impact the validity of search engine uh, when people go to their mobile phone if advertisers are going to sort of get a first place in line? Um, well, how Google and being in Yahoo work, it's more from, they have algorithms in place, so I don't believe it will. The impact is, is not going to be, there won't be any impact. I don't foresee I might be wrong. Uh, for instance, last, last two quarters, Google mobile search mm -hmm. was at 400%, the amount of mobile searches. So there's still a ton of search going on for what people are looking for. And the really cool thing about mobile 70% of people are likely to make an action within one hour of that search. An action meaning a call to the business, an online order, or a click for directions. And that sort of, so makes, mobile search, and that sort of makes sense because you're out and about. Will these platforms also then allow people to use their mobile phones to make the purchase once they show up to the ice cream shop? Absolutely, yes. There's amazing companies out there that are, we call it the local commerce payment space. There are amazing companies doing amazing things. We're still, I think we're still on the bottom of the first inning of an extra inning, of an extra inning baseball game. And it's, it's exciting to watch. There's companies like Breadcrumb that's innovating in this space. Um, Squares, of course, is oh, innovating in the space. But I think in five to seven years, the wallet will be less seen in a retail environment. Do you think this helps uh, some of the sites out there that are making the transition to mobile and say, how am I going to earn money from advertising? For example, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, they've all been having this controversy of when you move from the desktop to the mobile device, how do those ads translate? Is this then going to help those services as well? I, I think it absolutely will, yes. Okay, and tell me a little bit about your You're going to start seeing... 
Go ahead, Andrew. You're going to start seeing a lot. So they haven't really figured it out because it's typical advertising just in a mobile platform. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to start seeing more in-stream advertising, which is going to help them monetize a little better. All right. It's going to be a better user experience. Andrew Katz from Thumb Friendly. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Looking ahead, President Obama speaks tomorrow night to Congress and the nation in his State of the Union address. What his plans will mean for business. I'm Andrew Schmertz. Thanks for watching Arise Exchange.